Thanks for tuning in to this latest video weather briefing on El Nino, the status of El Nino, and the winter weather outlook. This is Alex Tardy, meteorologist with the National Weather Service in San Diego. Here's an animation of sea surface temperatures, and particularly note the region across the equator. That's the El Nino region or the ENSO region that we monitor for changes in warm water or cold water. This is a five-year animation, so it starts back in 2010 and runs all the way through currently August 2015. Notice also in the northern and western Pacific all those large areas of warm water that have been moving back and forth throughout the past two years, really, starting in 2012 in the West Pacific and then moving 2013 and 14 as seen here, moving in the Central Pacific, and then finally in 2014 reaching the west coast of the United States. Then notice drastically in late 2014 and early 2015 as shown here that the water really warms rapidly across the equator or the El Nino region. Okay, what is the El Nino phenomenon and how does it influence our atmosphere? Well, basically, the large area of warm or above normal sea surface temperatures, we call them SST anomalies across the equator, begins to influence the jet stream and it creates a stronger difference between colder air to the north and warm air to the south. This is most uh, obvious or prevalent in the atmosphere during the winter months as we have much more colder air due to the lower sun angle that drops across the northern part of the Pacific. But when this warm water remains in place, the two can cause the jet stream or the difference between cold and warm air to sink further south and influence Southern California. However, every El Nino is different as shown here. Sea surface temperature configurations can be in the western Pacific along the equator or focused across the eastern Pacific or like in 1997 to 98 that dominated the entire equator region. Well, we need to point out before we get too far ahead of ourselves that we're in the worst drought we've seen, at least the worst four-year drought across California. About 90% of the state is in a form of D2 to D4, so basically severe drought all the way to exceptional drought as shown here. What's caused this drought? Well, going back to 2013 to 2014, upper level ridge of high pressure was dominant through the entire wet season. That's October through April. And even at this time, what we have referenced the blob of warm water that was not in place across the West Coast, though it did exist over the Northern Pacific. During the 2014 and 15 season, the ridge of high pressure aloft, which basically is our jet stream, or what controls the jet stream, that shifted a little bit further east along the British Columbia and entire West Coast of the United States. And during this period, the warm sea surface temperatures also shifted across the west coast as shown in the lower right. So it's important to note that the warm water is not creating this ridge of high pressure aloft, but the result of the warm water or the shift could be largely attributed to the actual location of that upper level ridge of high pressure. So the atmosphere could be forcing and influencing, causing the warming of those sea surface temperatures, not the other way around where the sea surface temperatures are causing that ridge of high pressure. The past 48 months, record warmth across California. We have not seen a period this warm as shown on this diagram here. And almost three degrees above normal is the anomaly. Precipitation, that's what we usually associate drought with, right? Well, temperature is important too because it increases evaporation and stress on the environment and vegetation. But precipitation alone across the state, almost 27 inches is the deficit for the past 48 months. Just in the past year, percent of normal precipitation across California, all those orange and red shadings, that gives us a range of about 40% to as much as 80%. There are a few pockets uh, where precipitation was near normal. 
let's take a look at the missing years of precipitation across California. Well, basically one to two seasons, in some cases as much as two and a half seasons. You can see the LA Basin dipping down into Orange County is most severely impacted by this lack of precipitation in the past four years. We've seen it on the signs across the region, and it is a serious situation. So before we jump into expecting El Nino to break the drought, this is the most severe drought, and we need to continue to conserve and take caution of the lack of water across the region. Our water bills have also shown it, and we can need to continue sending this message out, even with expectations of El Nino coming up this winter. Here are the deficits that we're looking at. They're pretty remarkable. Pick your favorite location here in far Southern California. Let's look at San Diego, which has actually been one of the wetter locations in the past couple of years, relatively speaking. The precipitation needed to get back to normal is about two feet or 24 inches. The deficit is about 14 inches. So all the way through next year, so including this upcoming winter season and our deficit, we would need about two feet of rain. Most severe might be Orange County, where we see two and a half seasons of precipitation missing. They would need about 47 inches of rain to make up for that four-year deficit. Not likely to happen. Our fuel moistures continue to be about average thanks to a very wet May and July. But note here, they are dipping with recent lack of precipitation. All right, let's get into the El Nino strength and forecast over the next few slides. Historically, this is what El Nino has brought to the region. You can see our big El Nino years, 82, 83, 97, 98, were very wet. Don't confuse those with the big rain events we had in California of January 1997. Completely different year and a non-El Nino year. Don't confuse it with the wet year we had December 2010. That month was incredibly wet, as shown in the far right. That was a La Nina year. You can see not all La Ninos are the same in terms of the amount of precipitation they bring. Some are mixed across the state. Some are even dry. All right, does El Nino mean drought relief? Well, we'll need about 150% of normal precipitation in the key areas of Northern California, the Sierra Nevada, to get any type of drought buster. But past El Ninos have resulted in variable precipitation across the state. Moderate to strong El Ninos correlate very well, but only to Southern California. Keep in mind, with all this precipitation, we still need above normal snowpack. That is key. So even if we get heavy rain or rain on snow across the state, we still need to build that snowpack so that in April and May we have sufficient runoff to fill up the reservoirs. All right, what's happened in the past strong El Ninos? Well, on the left are the strong El Ninos we're going to focus on. And typically the jet stream dips across California into Texas and comes out across Florida. But note on the right, when we take out those two big years of 82, 83, 97, 98, that the signal of wet across California diminishes significantly. It does hold itself together across the immediate coast of Southern California and across Arizona and Texas and into parts of Florida. All right, let's compare the jet stream in the past couple of years. It's been basically missing us. And look at it on the right, what it does during El Nino. It cuts across Southern California into Texas and Florida, as shown here. And that's because what we talked about earlier, that tighter gradient between the warm atmosphere and warm ocean temperatures to the south and then the polar jet stream to the north. That basically phases jet stream together and becomes more consolidated and pointed across Southern California. Okay, if we compare the two years recently, Departure from normal of our jet stream. Look how severely departure from normal the jet stream across the Pacific. That huge ridge of upper level high pressure. And look at all the cool air. This is an upper part of the atmosphere across the northeast. But in our strong El Nino years, look at that gradient has shifted southward. 
So the battle zone becomes between the tropics and the polar jet stream, and that focuses most of the energy across Southern California and Texas. Pay attention to this map because this is a dramatic difference from past strong El Ninos and comparing to what seasons we've had just in the past two years and why we're in such a severe drought. All right, sea surface temperature anomalies. So on the left, the same past two years. Notice all that warm water was already in place in the North Pacific and the Baja region. But in those strong El Ninos, like we're expecting coming up this fall, all that warm water was located across the equator, and it also extended up in the Baja region thanks to those strong El Ninos. All right, take some time to look at this map here. This breaks down each month of historically strong El Ninos. Only the strong El Ninos are listed here. Notice in October, you get a wet signal that goes across Northern California. Then it covers most of the state in November, and then it dries out a little bit in December. It returns in January across Northern California, and of course, February and March, the wettest months. This doesn't guarantee that this upcoming season will work exactly like this, but it is important to note that February and March are very wet, at least historically, with strong El Ninos. When we look at all the El Ninos on the left, this is the signal we get. This is the weak, moderate, and strong. When we remove some of the big, strong El Ninos, we see that Northern California is very dry. So this is what we need to emphasize, is that El Nino does not have much relationship across Northern California, but it does for Southern California. Take a look at this map here, and our most recent El Nino from 2009-2010 Produced above normal precipitation, but only to the immediate coast of California. And then on the right, our last really wet year in California was actually a La Nina, as shown here. A couple other things to keep in mind. Sometimes strong El Nino can have a big impact on California, but only for a couple months. And in this case, 1965-66, it was very wet in November and December across Southern California, and then it pretty much dried out. The net result was that Northern California ended up being dry, despite a strong El Nino. So our classic El Ninos look like this. The ones we see 82, 83, 97, 98, which were very strong in terms of delivering a lot of precipitation. Now, these are our classic El Ninos. And it doesn't necessarily guarantee that this upcoming winter season will be the same. Take a look at some of the past El Ninos here. And please note that some of the El Ninos, even for Southern California, as shown here, San Diego, were actually normal. A couple examples are 1972 to 73, right around normal. And take a look at even the year 1991-92, despite having some very wet periods, we only ended up with about 12 inches of rain. So there is definitely a signal of a little bit above normal to much above normal with those strong El Ninos for Southern California. But it does not guarantee that we'll have much above normal precipitation like we saw in 82-83 or like we saw in 97-98. Some research recently from Scripps Institute of Oceanography showed that when you look at the relationship between El Nino and wet years, when you look at all the storms together, there is a strong signal across Southern California. But when you focus on those very wet big storms, those big atmospheric rivers, they're not associated with El Nino as circled in red. There's an area across the San Bernardino Mountains and the Sierra Nevada which that signal comes out clear. Most of the remaining storms on the far right do have correlation across Southern California, but Southern California only. Will we see a winter coming up that looks like this with flooding across far Southern California? Remains to be seen, but there is a correlation with the strong El Ninos to above normal precipitation. That basically means we get more storms, not necessarily stronger storms. Here's the current El Nino conditions across the Pacific. 
we are looking at moderate El Nino conditions across the Pacific on this current snapshot. Large area of above normal sea surface temperatures and also a large area above normal that is across the eastern part of the Pacific, well north of the equator. The reservoir, if you will, of warm water does extend pretty deep across the equatorial Pacific Ocean. That's good news for further strengthening our El Nino, bringing that water up to the surface. Here's what it looks like in the recent trends. Leveled off a little bit in some areas, but continues to strengthen in some of the important El Nino regions like the 3.4 region as shown here. You can see last year we were waffling around with a very weak El Nino, which never developed. All right, what is our computer model forecast? The consensus continues to increase. Now the latest forecast gets up to 2.5, and that's the average line as shown here. These are a consensus of computer models just released in the middle of August. And note the yellow line that gets up to about 2.5 late in the fall or early winter. Okay, now into the forecast. Here's the expectations for the fall. Upper left is the precipitation. So the green area, especially the dark green area, is the most confidence for the fall, September through November, to be above normal with precipitation. And in the lower right is the temperature. So the Pacific Northwest, where it's been very warm, is expected to continue to be warm into the fall, September through November. Unfortunately, there's not much correlation for the fall with El Nino, whether or not Santa Ana winds will be stronger or more events than normal. But the Santa Ana season will be a concern this fall with the dry fuel conditions. And what most people are probably waiting for, here's the precipitation or the outlook for January through March. So this is the heart of the winter. As we discussed earlier, that's the best correlation. And the expectations are for above normal precipitation, especially for far southern California, as shown here. That's where we have the most confidence, and that's where we expect the storm track to bring the stormiest weather pattern across the south. Not necessarily stronger storms uh, than usual, but more storms that add up to above normal precipitation. Keep in mind that once we get into the fall months, that the storm track will start shifting, but the heart of it is expected to be in the middle of the winter, December through March. Doesn't mean an end to the drought either, because there's much uncertainty across Northern California. We also need a significant snowpack to get out of the drought in addition to precipitation. Here are some summary bullets to take away. Currently, we're looking at El Nino conditions in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. They are present and they're strengthening. There's a good chance to see strong El Nino conditions by fall 2015. El Nino at the strong phase does not correlate well with Northern California, but it does correlate across Southern California to above normal precipitation for the winter months. El Nino can impact the jet stream and bring more frequent storms, but not necessarily stronger storms. It's important to note. El Nino does not guarantee above normal precipitation, and there have been several years with average El Nino years where average precipitation occurred in California, including even Southern California. Drought will continue since four-year deficits are huge with one to two seasons missed across the entire state. So we'll need much more precipitation to get rid of the drought.